Well, happy Feast of Trumpets, everybody. Sure is nice to see everybody here today. Sort of hard to come up after uh, what we'll call the musical offerings today after that and kind of get your uh, self together because we're very appreciative of the words that we're saying and everything that we just heard in the operatory uh, as well as the uh, special music. So thank you very much for that. Those words. Welcome any visitors we may have here. I see a few visitors, so welcome, welcome. Nice to have you here. We have a few people that are new today or visiting for the first time. We're out of town, so nice to have you here. Let's begin by turning to Luke 4. And in verse 14, this passage of scripture provides an interesting inference to the day of trumpets and what it represents. If you're not already there, please turn to Luke 14, verse 14, and we'll read all the way down to verse 21. But before we read, let's look at the background here and the context of what's going on. Jesus Christ has just completed 40 days and nights of fasting and has rejected Satan's three attempts to tempt him. And Jesus is beginning his three and a half year ministry of just beginning it. And he goes into the synagogues, as it says, in Galilee region and preaches repentance and the kingdom of God. And that it's a hand. Let's see something very interesting that was recorded by Luke in his gospel. Jesus goes into his home synagogue in Nazareth on the Sabbath day and reads from the scrolls. And either Jesus chooses a very interesting section or this is what's being typically read on this particular Sabbath or each chosen. Whatever the case, it's recorded and, and both options present something meant to, that he was meant to read and it was for him. Luke 4 verse 14. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee and news of him went out through all the surrounding region and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been taught, brought up. That's where he was brought up. He lived. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. So either he has something that was assigned to him by that day, or he had something he wanted to read, particularly. He found that place. And we could say, whatever the case, it wasn't random. Let's keep going. Verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed, anointed me. To preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recover, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus wanted those that were hearing to know that this part of the prophecy was being fulfilled by their hearing it at that very moment. From this point on, Jesus did indeed begin to fill 
what he had just read in the synagogue in Nazareth. The four Gospels indeed record dramatic accounts of Jesus fulfilling what he just read from Isaiah chapter 61, preaching good tidings to the poor, healing the brokenhearted, and proclaiming liberty to the captives. What I would like us to notice is where Jesus stopped reading in Isaiah 61. Based on how we divided up the scriptures, Jesus stops reading in the middle of verse 2 of Isaiah 61 and stops. Let's see where Jesus was reading from in Isaiah and turn to that section, Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. And we'll see where he stopped and he closed the book or rolled the scroll up or whatever he was reading from. And he did not keep reading. And there's a very good reason why he stopped where he did. So let's turn to Isaiah 61. If you haven't already done that, you can turn there and read this with me. Isaiah 61, verse 1. And you'll notice, it sounds just very familiar. But let's read from the beginning. The Spirit of the Lord of God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prisons to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And this is where Jesus stopped reading at this point because he knew what came next. And we should ask, what is the next part of verse 2? It says, And the day of vengeance of our God. Jesus stopped before reading this. Why? Because Jesus was not fulfilling this part of the prophecy at that time. but he will. This day pictures when Christ will come back to fulfill the rest of verse 2. The title of today's sermon, the message is Trumpets, the Fulfillment of Isaiah 61, verse 2. The full fulfillment. The day of trumpets pictures Christ fulfilling the next line of that verse. Today the message has three focus themes. Let me give those to you, three focus anchor themes. The blowing of the trumpets, the sealing of God's servants, and the seventh trumpet blast. So let's review the first part of the message and blowing of the shofar, the blowing of the trumpets. Actually, it's Trumpets and shofar, as we'll see. Let's turn to Leviticus, Leviticus 23 and see the command to observe this holy day. We covered this earlier, but let's read it again. Leviticus 23 is where all the feast days are codified in one location, one place. And we note, as we always do in Leviticus 23, verse 2, that God calls these my feast. Not the feast of the Jews or anybody else. My feast. They're his feast. Now let's go on to Leviticus 23, verse 23. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. Let's look what is stated in these two verses. We see a holy day starts on the first day of the seventh month in the sacred calendar, and we see this day as a Sabbath rest. We do no customary work on it. We see it's a holy convocation. 
or sacred assembly. For those who know the Hebrew word, Kodesh Mikra, Kodesh Mikra, holy assembly, convocation, summoning, coming together, assembly, being together. And it's so nice to see everybody together today, two congregations. Now we see this day included a very specific action, blowing or memorial or blowing of trumpets. Let's see how other translations put this because it gives it a more fuller meaning because it's just a little more than just trumpets. It says blowing of trumpets. Uh, the NIV says commemorated with trumpet blast. The ESV says a memorial proclaimed to blast of trumpets. The Biberian Study Bible says, a sacred assembly announced by trumpet blast. Young's Literal says, memorial of shouting. And that is part of it, shouting. There's, and we'll see, there's some examples. And there's a shout, along with trumpets. The Treasury of Scriptural Knowledge says, says this, better translates this, a memorial of triumph or shouting for joy with trumpets. Now, I think that's an excellent translation. The word here for trumpet is turah, as has been brought up over, the, over time. Turah. In Hebrew, it means a blast or a shout or a blast of war or alarm or joy. It can mean all those things, you know, alarm, joy, and a shout. And those are all parts of the meaning of today. All those, alarm, a blast of war, and joy as well. God instructed the Israelites to use, actually as well, we always think of the shofar, but silver trumpets. And you can read that in Numbers 10. To communicate on a number of occasions to the children of Israel, including the occasion of an appointed feast. And it's very important, we say an appointed feast. God appoints the time. And it's an appointed feast. In Numbers 10, you don't have to turn there, but let me just summarize it for you. There's five distinct types of trumpet signals that the priests would blow. And these are true silver, two silver trumpets. They're not, it's not a shofar in this case. And the last one in Numbers 10.10 10, is a blowing the trumpet on the day of gladness on the appointed feast. So there's also silver trumpets, and we also have the ram's horn, the shofar included. And I remember... Distinctly, for Kids Club, we did this. <laughs> I demonstrate this. We had Mr. Barbush and his trumpet, and we practiced the five distinct trumpet sounds, and the kids responded like, oh, this trumpet sound means this. And then the last one, of course, was an appointed sound for it's a feast day. Let's turn to Psalm 81. Psalm 81, and we see... Uh, a more direct reference to the shofar, which is what we typically think of the shofar. Psalm 81, verse 1. And these today, we've heard this in the sermon as well today, these are all familiar to us because we sing these hymns. We sing these psalms in our hymns. We know the words. And you can almost, as we read them, sing them to yourselves because we know we have them in our hymns and we have a, a, a tune in our head or the way it's put to, get, put to music. Psalm 81, verse 1, sing aloud to God our strength, make a joyful shout to the God of Jacob, raise a song and strike the timbre, the pleasant harp with the flute, blow the trumpet. And that is shofar, ram's horn, at the time of the new moon. And as we'll see, it's a very specific new moon, not any new moon, but a specific new moon and at the full moon on our solemn feast day. But this is a statue for Israel, a law of God of Jacob. Now let me read you from one commentary from expositors to show that this is not just any new moon of the month. That this new moon is the beginning of the Feast of Trumpets, the seventh month. Expositors says, in hymnic form, the covenant community is called on to celebrate the festivals corporately. Together they sing joyously to the accompaniment of musical instruments. The full moon fell on the 15th of the lunar month, 
and coincided in the seventh month with the Feast of Tabernacles. This festival was of the great, greatest import to, in the Old Testament and was also known as the Feast. And what do we do today? We say, we're going to the Feast. And they did the same thing. We don't spell out four distinct holy days necessarily. We're going to the Feast. We don't always say the Feast and the last great day or the eighth day. We just say we're going to the Feast. And that's what they did. It's also known as the Feast or our Feast. Its purpose was to proclaim aloud the mighty acts of the Lord in the history of salvation, beginning with Exodus. This blowing of the shofar at the time of the new moon is referring to the new moon of the seventh month on the Feast of Trumpets that the ram's horn or shofar was blown on that day. We see that a shofar was blown by the priest on this day, and unlike the silver trumpets that we mentioned in Numbers 10 that could produce a variety of musical notes. The ram's horn produced a more piercing blast. And if you've heard of shofar, which most of us have, it's a piercing blast. Let's look at the examples how the shofar was used in scripture to signal God's presence. So we see the shofar specifically being used to show God's presence. We see this in Exodus 19, where God is descending onto Mount Sinai. Exodus 19, and God is descending on Mount Sinai. Exodus 19, verse 16. You can turn there with me. Again, this might, must have been quite the uh, experience, seeing this, hearing this, experiencing what was going on here. And it has a very similar feel to it as what we read later on, going on when Christ returns. Exodus 9, verse 16 says, Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and the sound of the trumpet, shofar, was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet, the shofar, sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him by voice. So let's notice, God's descending on Mount Sinai. We have massive sounds of thunder, lightning, quakes, smoke, and the sound, the very loud sound of the piercing sound of the ram's horn. The shofar signal was a very clear signal that God was present and involved with the children of Israel. Exodus 20, verse 18 shows that all present heard the sound of the shofar. In scripture, we see the ram's horn used to announce that God's involvement is about to occur in the lives of men and women. We see in Joel 2, when the trumpet will be blown to signal God's involvement in the affairs of mankind. Here is reference to as the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. The term the day of the Lord is, is when God interfered, intervenes, I should say, intervenes in, in the affairs of men. The day of the Lord. Let's turn there and read this, Joel 2, verse 1. Joel 2, verse 1. Joel writes, Blow the trumpet, the shofar, in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. For it is hand, at, a hand, at hand a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like the morning clouds spread over the mountains. A people come great and strong, they like of whom have, has never been, 
nor will there ever be any such after them, for even for many successive generations. The term of the day of the Lord is a term used in the Bible in a time when God intervenes in man's affairs. And it also marks the end of this present age and the beginning of the new age, when Christ claims his rightful place on earth as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So let's look at that for a moment. Christ returns, signaled by a sound of a great trumpet. A great trumpet. In Revelation, the Apostle John was shown the events that would occur, that will occur, when he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, as it's stated in Revelation 1.10. Revelation 1, 10, 10, he's in the Lord's day, the spirit of the Lord's day. He was seeing what was going to occur, to bring on the Lord's day. And the day of the Lord is when the trumpet is sounded and God intervenes directly in the affairs of mankind. Why does God and Christ specifically have to intervene in the affairs of mankind? Well, let's turn to the Olivet Prophecy. Probably name that because that's where Jesus was. He was on Mount of Olives. And the disciples asked them some questions about when he would return, the signs of what they would be before he, when he returned, what would happen, what would be like. And he tells them, Revelation 24.3, sorry, Matthew 24.3, if you'd like to turn there, or I or can read it to you, Matthew 24, verse 3. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us. When will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Notice, they ask, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the, your, this age, or the age? Christ goes on to describe a time of great tribulation or troubles that will occur. This time is not caused by God, but the final deception and difficulty orchestrated by the anger of Satan. It describes a time that has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. Daniel, and what he is told by the archangel Michael of this time in Daniel 12, and I'll just reference this, he says, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time, and that, at that time, your people shall be delivered. So we see some similarities of what the archangel Mike, Michael told Daniel, as well what Christ is telling his disciples. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 22, And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. This is when Christ steps in, otherwise Satan would lead mankind to a point of such extreme anger that mankind would destroy themselves, given the opportunity. That's how bad it will get, the emotions, the anger. This is where Christ will fulfill where he stopped in Isaiah 61, verse 2, the day of vengeance of our God, as it's called in Isaiah 61 to begins. Let's read this in Matthew 24, verse 29. Matthew 24, verse 29. In verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will, be, will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Christ is ushering in a new age. It's announced by the great sound of a trumpet. The new age with Christ as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, a wonderful counselor, Prince of Peace, reigning on this earth as his government will be ordered 
and established with judgment and justice from this time forward. Never to end, the zeal of the Lord of hosts or armies will certainly perform this. The shofar specifically has great meaning in the return of Christ, a meaning in the blast that a day of alarm, war, as well as joy is being blasted. That's what it tells us. As we see what the state pictures with the use of trumpets to signal the coming of a new king, let's spend some time on the first trumpet that is blown in Revelation. There's seven trumpets blown. And there is, as we've talked about before, a significance on the first trumpet to the elect or called out ones in this age. The first trumpet. Christ reveals to the Apostle John when he was on the island of Patmos and John was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard Christ speak in a loud voice as of a trumpet, a vision of seven trumpets being blown starting in chapter 8 of Revelation. Now there's a significant meaning for us in the first trumpet for all that God is calling in this age. Let's turn to Revelation 8 to see where the seven trumpets are introduced. Seven trumpets introduced. Revelation 8, verse 1. And when he opened the seventh seal, and if you remember, Revelation is really about seven seals being opened. And the seventh seal opens, we have seven trumpets that are part of that last seal. When he opens the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them was given seven trumpets. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of that, of the incense, with the prayers of the saints, ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. This is the first trumpet in the beginning of the day of the Lord. In Isaiah 61, it was called the day of vengeance. Let's go back and get the context of why this is important to us. Let's go back to chapter 6 of Revelation to see the significance to us and the very important understanding for us, what we should understand, what we should take home, we should think about on this day. The book of Revelation, as I said, opens up seven seals, and on the seventh seal is the seven trumpets that are introduced. Let's go back to Revelation 6, 9 to see the fifth seal being opened up. So we're back, going back a little bit, the fifth seal. Isaiah, sorry, Revelation 6, 9. Revelation 6, 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, true and ho holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each one of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who be killed as they were was completed. It's sort of as like the blood of Abel, which, which God had still not avenged. The blood of Christ's servants call out to God to intervene. And again, this is symbolic, crying out. And God gives two responses. First, a white robe was given to each one of them. Second, it was said to them they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren 
who would be killed as they were was completed. So we see two groups. But God waits until the very end. Notice that. He waits till the very end <laughs> to revenge his saints. And he only does this once. He only does this once. Now let's now read in Revelation 6.12. And we'll see the sixth seal. The sixth seal. So we're moving forward towards the seventh. And we see something here very interesting that happens. Something that's very interesting that's told to one of the angels. Revelation 6, verse 12. I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black and sack, as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. So some very dramatic things are happening. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountain and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. So again, it indicates there is the lamb of God, Jesus Christ. And he's coming down and, they enter, and this is what's being said. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? Who is able to stand? No, there's a lot to explain, but I wanted to focus on the sixth seal that is opened and we read that the wrath of the Lamb is about to take place. Who is able to stand? Who is able to stand? Keep that question in your mind. Who is able to stand? Let's keep on reading. If you see something very important for us, and I want us to see what takes place before the first trumpet. Something that happens before the first trumpet is sounded. Revelation 7, verse 1. Revelation 1, verse 7. Then these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Notice, this is a time that is after the great tribulation, we see it, what transpires that we see in the fifth seal, that transpires in the fifth seal. Before Christ fulfills the day of vengeance, God protects his people from this destruction that's about to occur. What is the sealing? What is the sealing? Well, the Greek word there means to stamp with a signet or a private mark for security or preservation. So this is the seal of God. It shows who are his. He seems to indicate and acknowledge that these are my servants. These are my servants before sending the angels of destruction. God first identifies his servants with a mark or stamp on their foreheads. Something that shows that these are mine. The implication is, the sea servants belong to me. Don't touch them. We are to see a great multitude with great white robes washed with the blood of the lamb. We see that, we also see that. So we see two groups, the 144,000, as well as a great multitude. All this occurs before the first trumpet sounds. What is it that we should understand from this? What is it that we should understand? By the time the first trumpet is sounded, it is determined who are God's, who are his servants. He knows who are his. And there's no uncertainty, there's no vagueness. He knows who are his. It's a line in the sand, you might say, a line in the sand that gets drawn. These are my servants, and he knows who they are. No more time is on the clock, we might say. You know, there's no more time left. It's clear. These are my servants, and it's clear. Interestingly, to make that point right after the Olivet Prophecy, Jesus gives us a parable, a parable of the wise virgins. The wise virgins 
had their lamps and they had oil. The unwise, the wise had their lamps full of oil. The unwise, they had those that they were empty or not full. And what did they hear? They heard the call at midnight that the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. And we know the parable well. The wise were ready, the unwise were not. Time had run out for them to fill their lamps with oil. We were only granted so much time. Filling up the lamp with oil takes time. It's not something we can do in a few minutes, a few hours, even a few days. It takes time filling up the oil, the Holy Spirit. We can't slumber. We can't slumber or sleep and be like, well, I have another day. I have tomorrow. I have next week to fill up the lamp with, and be full of God's Spirit working in us. Let me read some scriptures that are here for us to help us be alert, to remind us on this day. Be alert, be awake, and there is going to be a call. The bridegroom is coming. And time, that, seventh, that first trump will sound, and that's the marker. That's the time where God knows those are his. First, First Thessalonians 5.6. I'll read this to you. Just, you can just listen and jot down the scripture if you like. First Thessalonians 5.6 says, Therefore let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Watch and be sober. We heard a sermon about being, sermonette about being sober. Ephesians 6.18 says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to his end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 says, Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. So again, another watch. We've got to be watching for the bridegroom to come back and be ready. 1 Peter 4, 7 says, But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. So, very serious message to the Church of God. Be watchful, no slumbering. Be a wise virgin. Using God's spirit. Look at your lamp. Is it half full or is it full? And is it growing every day? We are to watch and stand fast in the faith, which is also a part of the significant meaning of the trumpets, of the trumpet sound to each one of us. We are to be awake spiritually and ready each year, the Day of Trumpets is an annual alarm to be awake spiritually. It's like, oh, the alarm clock went off. Am I ready? Take a count. Each one of us can only account for ourselves if we're ready. Are we awake spiritually? Alert, watching, and checking our spiritual oil lamps. Are they full? Jesus said in Matthew 24, in verse 43, but know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So there's a cutoff point, a line in the sand, when Christ says, I know these, they're mine. Put his seal on them. Christ said, Blessed is a servant whom, when he comes, will find doing. The instructions, the command, the teachings of Jesus Christ. Doing what? That's what? The command. Doing what I said. Those that are doing, those that are spiritually growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Continuing to overcome and building character the character of God, with the Holy Spirit living in them. These are likened to the ones that are standing on the rock, on the rock, standing on the rock, who, when it, the winds come and blows and the rain comes, and in hard, they're still standing because they're standing on the rock, because they're doing what Christ said. 
That is the part of watching and being serious about the times that we live in. There is a future point in the time when the first trumpet is blown and time runs out. Let us not have empty lamps when that trumpet is blown. The announcement that the bridegroom is coming, when we hear that, let's be confident, assured. Yes, I'm ready. I've been watching, I've been ready, I've been diligent. I'm assured of my standing boldly when Christ returns, because my oil lamp is full. I'm confident. Let us make sure that we're spiritually close to God and he knows where to put the seal, right? <laughs> it's like, oh, I, I can, that's easy. There's one, there's one, there's one. There's no doubt. As we stay close to God and follow the voice of the good shepherd, then we will be where we need to be for God to place the seal showing where he is, where we are that we are his people. So let's be close to God, hearing the voice of the Good Shepherd and being in the right place for God to put the seal on us and doing what we need to do, standing on the rock, full of God's spirit, growing in grace and knowledge, full of God's character living in us or growing in us. Right, let's go on to the uh, final trump, the seventh trumpet. Why the seventh trumpet is a day of vengeance and the fulfillment of the rest of verse 2 of Isaiah 61. Let's go to uh, Revelation 11, 11 verse 15. Revelation 11 verse 15. Revelation 11 verse, Revelation 11, verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come. Because you have taken your great power and reigned, the nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead they should be judged. And that you should reward, reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple, and there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. This is the fulfillment of what Daniel was shown in Daniel 2, when the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed and will stand forever. This is the same event we read in Matthew 24, verse 30, when it says, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven and with power and great glory, and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Christ comes back, and it is the day of the Lord, and also an aspect of the day of wrath, a day of vengeance, as prophesied in Psalm 2. Right? We have Psalm 2, and the nations were angry. That's how it describes the whole world, that when he comes back, the nations, nations were angry. Those who oppose Christ are referred to in Revelation 17 and 13 as those with one mind, and they will give power and authority to the beast. These will make war with the lamb. So these are people that are adversarial, they're against Christ, they've given their everything to the beast power, and they're willing to fight. There's no, there is nothing left to do but God, Christ coming back and showing the wrath of God for what they've done and their mindset, and for them following 
and giving all to the beast power. Where we see all, all these armies with one mind attack and make war against the Lamb. These are armies influenced by Satan who do not want to give up their ideas, philosophy, their power, and they want to oppress others. That's really what the beast power does. <laughs> it, they're influenced by Satan. They want it. They have their own idea, their own philosophy that's against God. Christ will then usher in peace and righteousness and will overcome those who make war with him. Revelation 19 and 11 says, We see heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. So it's, he, go, he, he takes care of the, the, these folks who are against him. Christ stopped reading in Isaiah 61, verse 2. But here we see the day of vengeance being fulfilled. Now, thankfully, that's just a very small part of the seventh trumpet. We also see at the seventh trumpet, the last trumpet, sound a special time for the elect. Let's look at that. Let's look at that. 1 Thessalonians 4.16. Thessalonians 4.16. It says in verse 16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. We see a similar passage in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, it says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of the eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Let's talk about that for a moment. There's six things that Paul writes here in 1 Corinthians 15 that are going to be different. It's encouraging to us. We covered a little bit of this in Munster yesterday, or on, on Sabbath. So let me summarize the six things that the Apostle Paul states about what this means for the faithful in Christ at his return. Very encouraging for us, whatever state we may be in right now. First, it says, number one, we are sown in corruption, or a perishable body, or ra but raised in incorruption. It's verse 42. Now think about this. We all, everyone here, reflects a physical life. All of our bodies <laughs> are in some form of decay, deterioration, subject to injury, disease, deterioration. And all of us, some of us sooner than others, run out of steam. Every day it might be it. You know, for me, it's starting to be earlier every day. You know, I used to be able to, like, get up, get going, and go all day. And then it's like, well, you know, I'm starting to run out of steam. Um, physical strength is limited. And eventually, it fails us. All of us, especially you talk to the older brethren that are here, what was once a strong body, in many cases, runs out, and it doesn't work for them anymore the way it used to. It wears out. Death is our enemy in our physical life. But what does Paul write here? But we're raised incorruptible. A body that doesn't fail. It's not subject to disease. Which, okay, if you have a body right now that does not work for you, how encouraging is this? How encouraging is this? Be raised incorruptible. What else does he say? That was one, sown in dishonor, raised in glory. That's verse 43. None of us, as we talked about last on the Sabbath of Munster, none of us, even in our best condition, in our best, and if you're blessed with a great body and good looks and muscles, even in that best state, 
it's not that gloriful. It's not that much glory that goes with that. Um, you know, we talked about that a little bit. I bet you won't get into that today, but there's a lot of problems with us humans. Uh, no matter how blessed we may be, and certainly we are not blessed, our human condition has some problems. What does Paul say? You know, what a wretched man I am. You know, that's how he skewed himself, a wretched man. <laughs> and he kind of saw the reality of his, man, of his the reality of himself. But it says, we are raised to the glory. It says in Colossians 3, 4, that when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. A lot to be, could be said about that. We've covered that. Raised in glory. Number three, sown in weakness, raised in power. Sown in weakness, raised in power. Think about that. No more being tired, needing sleep, unable to do something, but raised in power. And I was thinking about this. This means a lot of things. I can't particularly sing very well or play an instrument. That's sort of a weakness. <laughs> but I hope that when that day comes and we can be in spirit beings, I hope that I have a voice that can sing in a choir like I heard today and play an instrument. So whatever weaknesses we have, whatever inabilities we have, whatever things we can't do, and we're sown in weakness, but raised in power, spirit being, and all the things that go along with that. Power will take us far beyond what we can do today. In human terms, you can't run a marathon. <laughs> That's okay. And maybe when you're a spirit being, you won't want to. But you can if you want to. When God, when you're going to be raised in power. Whatever it is, you know, that you can't do today will be nothing as a spirit being. You'll be raised in power. Verse 4, or number 4, it says, Sown in a natural body, but raised in a spiritual body. Again, no more spiritual limitations, but spirit beings. You know, being able to not be phys not limited by physical things. You know, or we can go here, we can go there, we can do all sorts of things. We're not bound by the physical laws that... You know, gravity and whatever else might be out there. Raised in a spiritual body. Oh, incredible. Number five, he puts this, we're born, we're born in the image of the dust of man, the man of dust. Made of dust, but then will bear the image of the heavenly man. So Adam, he was formed from the dust of the ground. And we all reflect that first man that was ever created. The man of dust. With all... The issues that came with that. But what? We will bear the image of the heavenly man. Jesus Christ will be like as he is. What a wonderful vision of the future. At the seventh trump. He also says mortal to immortality. Mortal to immortality. Again, every one of us here. The minute we're born, we come out, the shelf life is put on us. We begin to deteriorate. We begin to, we have an end time. We have an end date. And, but mortal to immortality, a point where we don't die. It says, we read that on Sabbath in, uh, in Chicago. We'll be like the angels who do not die, spirit beings. You know, it says, death is conquered. No more death. Immortality, eternity. This is the seventh trump, what it pictures. Incredible time. This describes, this time describes the joyous time of being born into the kingdom of God, a member of the God family. For those who are sealed, have God's spirit, born in the kingdom of God. What a family reunion to see who's there. All the people that we've lost over the years, they're in God's church, to see them again. At that time, what a family reunion! I can. Somebody asked, "Who would you most look forward to seeing?" There was a lot of people that we look forward to see on that time. If we're blessed to do what to be there and fortunate enough to be there, raised up in spirit, who else in the body of Christ? So many people have gone in our midst, and we'll see them again. Not in the way we last saw them, many of them in a weakened state, 
decrepit body, just a small figment of what they used to be as a strong man or a robust woman who can do things about it. Many people die and they're just nothing like they were at their strength. And we'll see them, God's family, the first fruits, and it being pronounced good and faithful servant, a life to eternity. Again, we, we discuss that in our kids' club. Every opening kids' club, we say, look around. And we say to the kids, look around. These are your friends forever, eternity, forever. And that's what we can do. We look around. Who are you sitting next with today? And who are you sitting next to? Who's behind you? Who's in front of you? Who are you with today? And a, there'll be a point where it's going to be reality that it's eternity. We can look back and say, oh, I remember a million years ago. And I always say the same thing, I know. We can say, remember when we sat in those horrible chairs in Hinsdale? Or today, maybe in Oak Lawn, all those uncomfortable chairs, and they made my back hurt. Well, we won't have any back aches, then we'll be spirit beings, but we can look back fondly, and there'll be a reality. What seems like the future, a, vi- a thing that's promised, we'll look back, and it'll be reality. In a million years, a billion, billion years, eternity, there is no end. And we can look back and laugh. Oh, remember when we used to think this, or we used to laugh about this, or we used to complain about this, or my back, or my leg, or my whatever, my stomach problems, or whatever it may be, right? <laughs> uh, well, no more. And, and it will seem such, such like a very small piece of time. Like, oh, it seemed like, you know, sometimes we, in our own physical life, you know, we, it seems like, you know, high school went by like that. At the time, it seemed like forever, right? Oh, high school, you know, ninth grade. When will I get to 10th grade? When will I get to 11th grade? And it seems like it just goes forever. And then you look back and like, what happened? It just went by like that. That's what it will seem like for us a million years from now, in eternity, in our, as spirit beings, sons of God, in the family of God. Whatever we suffer right now will seem just like a very small moment in time, and it'll just be like, oh, yeah, I did kind of have a bad moment in time. But things were that great, but it seems so far away now. And we'll have this very, and we'll have a vague memory of it. A life of eternity. And we'll say, I'm sure, it sure is great to be a spirit being now. And when we were physical, that was so long ago. <laughs> It'll be wonderful. And when we see the reality, we see this is, the, this is not a future time, but well, a future time when we'll look back in verse John 3, 2. And it isn't a future time, but it'll be the past. When it says, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we, wait, what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That will be the past. <laughs> that won't be the future. We will be like as he is, sharing in the inheritance, sharing in the glory. Wonderful time ahead. This, there will be a time when we look at Romans 8, 18, when Paul said, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. There'll be a time when they're revealed. These are the sons of God. And creation, the inheritance, what God has in store for all of the family of God to do as spirit beings will be a reality. It will be in the past and going forward. The seventh trump and this day has a very special hope and meaning for us. A time of alarm, but great, great joy as we consider being born into the family of God and part of the everlasting kingdom of God. As we conclude, let's go back to where Jesus read the first one and a half verses of Isaiah 61 and and said to the people listening that day in the synagogue, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He stopped reading because Jesus knew that the next line was a future fulfillment. 
the proclaim of the day of vengeance of our Lord. But let's not stop there, because there's much more future beyond that day of vengeance. That is just one verse. And he stopped before reading it. But let's look what's after it. For there's only one line, one part of a verse, that's in the whole section here. All 11 verses. There's much, much more yet to come. Much more to come after this day. Isaiah 61 covers what God is going to do. The full vision of time reflected in the millennium and bringing many to salvation, glory and righteousness. A time when all are living in peace, blessed abundantly. Let's read the rest of the story, as you might say. The complete fulfillment of Isaiah 61. Let's go back, if you're there, Isaiah 61, and we'll read the whole section here. Because we know it doesn't end after, it doesn't stop at verse 2. It keeps going. And it describes a wonderful time. Pictures the millennium and even beyond. Isaiah 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. And let's see, look, let's look at what comes next, because it doesn't end there. It keeps on going, and it keeps getting better and better and better. To comfort all who mourn. To console those who mourn in Zion. To give them beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness that they may be called trees of righteousness. So we seem to see a change. God's going to comfort. Christ is going to comfort. He's going to change. Those who mourn are going to be comforted. He's going to, here, and here's, some, here's beauty for ashes. I love that. Here's exchange. Beauty for ashes. And the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And they shall, be rebuilt, they re, shall rebuild the old ruins, and shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the ruined cities. So again, we see the millennium pictured here, things being rebuilt, good things happening, the desolations of many generations, strangers shall stand and feed your flock, so people will getting along, and the sons of the foreigner shall be your plowman and your vine dresser, but you shall be named the priest of the Lord. They shall call you the servants of our God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory you shall boast. So, I mean, everybody's doing well. It's not limited. Instead of your shame, you shall have double honor. Instead of confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess double. Everlasting joy shall be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery for burnt offerings. I will direct their work in truth. A whole different approach. And will make them, make with them an everlasting covenant. Their descendants shall be known among the Gentiles and their offspring among the people. And all who see them shall acknowledge them. That they are the posterity whom the Lord has blessed. Wonderful time. And finally, Verse 10, I will, re I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he has clothed me with the garment of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its bud, as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all nations. Brethren, this holy day is full of meaning and a future fulfillment. Let's keep watching, 
standing fast. Our time is now. Let's be called chosen and faithful to the invitation God has given us to be spiritual children in God's glorious kingdom and family.